you got to work on brand sentiment right now. It's an absolute F. It's in the toilet, right? And so things where you can bring in big enterprises or big companies and actually illustrate interesting things, even if it is faux Web 3, Web 2.5, is good brand sentiment driving. It is not going to be what makes like crypto in the future. It is not going to be the breakout app and experience. It's not going to generate hundreds of millions of users for these protocols, but it's going to help with sentiment. When you start to improve sentiment at a macro level and at a protocol level, developers become interested in the space. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Lightspeed. Today we have Ryan Wyatt, who is the president and now advisor at Polygon Labs. Ryan, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. It's good to be here. Yeah, we're pumped to have you here. Look, I love interviewing people that worked on real products in Web2 and now are in Web3. So you worked at YouTube for eight years as their head of gaming. You started at 27 years old, which is absolutely nuts to me. It's younger than I am today. Um, and then you made the leap into Web3 and you joined Polygon. So I would just like a little bit of a history of what you did at YouTube, what got you there, and then what made you take that jump. Because at the time, crypto had a lot of hype. I think this was January 2022 and you made the jump. But yep. also, if you looked at crypto products then compared to what you're doing at YouTube, I'm sure it was a pretty pale comparison. I would love yeah. a little bit of background there. Yeah, happy to. So, um, you know, when I was I was at college at Ohio State, I was always in esports, played video games competitively, Counter-Strike, Call of Duty. And I just, you know, I was working. I, I realized that like I needed to figure out what I want to do. Like I was really passionate about gaming and, and, and particularly video content around it because esports, I like watching esports broadcasts. And this was very nascent. You know, I mean, we're talking, you know, I don't know, gosh, 2008, seven, right? So a long time ago. Um, and, and that kind of led me to MLG where I was already kind of playing and then wanted to figure out how I could work for them. So I volunteered for MLG and I did everything. I was, I, I started commentating these events. I was like refereeing stations. I was helping set up tournaments. You know, I was still in college traveling around to these events and it was really fun. Um, you know, fast forward that I, I really focused staying on that. Got a job at a company called Machinima, which was really trying to build out the first gaming video network on YouTube. So that those that liked video games, you weren't watching on cable television anymore. You were starting to watch, you know, video content online. How could we really take that part over for gamers? Super fun. A lot of shenanigans working there. Learned a ton. It was my first job out of college. Got to move out to LA. Had never been to LA before. Just make the move out there. Um, you know, and I was from Ohio, so it was easy to please from a weather standpoint, all these things being in my like young 20s, being in California. Machinima gets an investment from Google Ventures at the time. Um, and so we start to establish a really close relationship with Google. That led me to have, you know, some connections in there. And I used to write YouTube and Google all these kind of basically these long-winded notes of all of their shortcomings, right? And how it negatively impacted us as a company, right? Because we were, all of our content was on YouTube. So we're like completely beholden to that as a product. So, you know, whether things got, you know, there wasn't monetization or the product features were behind or things that we wanted to do. Um, I often, you know, discuss of the things that, you know, that, that they were falling short of. And so when Susan Wojcicki came in, uh, Google started in Susan's garage. So she was a powerhouse. Uh, she's already at Google. She comes over as the CEO of YouTube. She's like, look, I got all, I've got kids. They love video games. We don't have anybody here that knows anything about video games. This like crazy guy from Machinima keeps emailing us about all the things that we're not doing right. And so, you know, 15, 16 interviews later, uh, I got brought in as the head of gaming at YouTube. I was 27 years old um, and I had to build out that team. And it was it was quite an experience, and I always really appreciated them taking a chance on me so young. Um, you know, I, I felt the weight of that and wanted to make sure I, I came through for them for putting all that trust in me. So that's the that's a quick story of my YouTube time. Ryan, what did the landscape and gaming even look like then for YouTube? So I remember back in college, this was like 2014, uh, I was sitting in class and these people in front of me watching other gamers play games. And that like blew my mind. I was like, why are you sitting there watching someone else playing a game? So was that, that hadn't caught on yet. Is that what was going on when you joined YouTube? What was the landscape like? Yeah, it's great. So in when I was at Machinima, we were starting to do gaming. Gaming didn't really exist on the platform. We were we were starting off because it, there's a number of reasons why it didn't exist. One, YouTube, it's so early in YouTube's days. It's still known for like cat videos, Charlie bit my finger, yada, yada, right? So this idea, you're going to put gaming videos up there is a little unusual to begin with because of this concept. Who wants to watch people play video games? Then there were a number of things that started to happen. <clears throat> One, monetization. So Machinima as a network could start to put ads in front of video. So now there's a revenue stream in that you could like reinvest. And so you get better content, you get more content, so forth. Then the other, there's like multiple factors that we had no control over that really helped as a catalyst for gaming content. This is still, this is like 0809. Dazzle Capture Card comes out. 
makes it makes it really cheap. It's like 49 bucks. Anybody can buy it. You plug in your Xbox into it. Then you just start capturing content. Then PC started to get cheaper. Broadband internet connectivity started to get better on your upload stream, which is what you're dependent on for streaming. You know, people had to have like two PCs and shit to stream content. It was not realistic at all, right? And so these barriers, these hardware barriers, like started to break down and get really much more cost efficient, which then creators started to flood in. And then you sort of have this kind of thing. Well, there's now there's more views, which draws more 13, 18 year old males into the audience. That is a hard audience to monetize. So now it's like, how do we put ads on this content? Then you do mobile mobile ads and then you do like mid rules and all these different things. And so when I came in as that a game, it was 2014. There was there was a, a con- there was like content there, right? But the problem was YouTube had always kind of swept it under the ground be- or under the rug because they're like, is this really what we want to be? Do we want to be a platform of like cat videos and gaming videos? And so when you go, when you went into YouTube in 08 and 09, there was all these categories on how they discovered content, but gaming was never one of them. like pets and animals, automobiles, whatever, right? But what gamers started to do would be like, oh, this is a warthog video in Halo. So it's auto, um, automobiles, right? They started to they started to really like you know scheme the the system, and now ultimately you were just kind of swimming upstream, and so they wanted to lean into gaming. But this concept that people want to watch people play video games was really foreign, and even me, young, I hated watching my brother play. So like I could have I was empathetic to where people were coming from, but I don't know. I was like I'm into this shit. There's got to be at least some people that are like me that will want to watch it as well. I didn't actually know you worked at Machinima. That's that's awesome because I used to watch Machinima videos. When I was younger, to I think like maybe the reason was to get an edge over other people playing games, yeah. uh, and like it's kind of like sports where you like watch other people who play sports so you can get better at sports. It's kind of the same with gaming at the time. Um, okay, so this is like um, 2013, I believe, right? Yeah, so 2013, I'm you know I'm, I I leave uh, Machinima to go back to Major League Gaming. It was the VP of programming. I love that gig. It was fun to go back to MLG. Had a first fun run there when I was in college getting to run all of our programming, you know, doing the big esports events that we were putting on the live broadcast, but it was short lived. I was only there eight months because I got recruited by Google and that, you know, that's a once in a life op- lifetime opportunity. So uh, as much as I loved MLG to this day and it holds a special place in my heart, I had to go do that. And so when I went into YouTube, you know, I had a little bit of imposter syndrome because, you know, you sit in a room of the other leaders, like Leo Cohn's ahead of music. You know, this guy, Kanye West has dropped lyrics in his songs about Leo, like Jay-Z has, you know, like this is a big music mogul who is your peer for music. And I'm like the gaming bro, you know, that had been like fucking around doing gaming videos the last, you know, both like at night streaming and then working the, the nine to five in the space of Machinima or MLG. And so it was an advantage because I'm like, look, out of all you guys, I actually use the product. I know it well. My best friends are creators. We're on this shit every single day. So nobody in this room knew YouTube better than me, but all of them were seasoned execs, veterans, come from these very prestigious backgrounds. So for me, it took a little bit to learn from them and um, you know, soften out some of my rough edges, learn how to be a leader, how to bring people along, how to like think a little bit bigger strategically than just gaming. Um, like what can kind of gaming do for YouTube instead of like, what can YouTube do for gaming kind of concept, you know, like JFK, if you will. Um, and so it took a little bit for me to, to really learn that and, and like ingrain that into me. But um, it was amazing. I mean, what an amazing experience and opportunity. Would you say that the maybe public perception of gaming and maybe actually streaming for, for gamers was similar to the sentiment of how people look at crypto? as kind of just being like a, maybe a bit fringe or do you think it was totally different? Just trying to understand what, you know, that was. You know, I, think really the, like. um, I think there's definitely a decent, I mean, I've seen a lot of parallels and similarities in between the two. Like certainly those that were on the outside all hated it. Like my girlfriend at the time in college was, I mean, it was like a re- practically a reason we broke up. It was just like, you're insane. Even my good friends, it was very hard for them to process. And I got that. Like I, I totally was empathetic because I, it's not like when I was first going into it, I so clearly saw that this was going to be YouTube's second biggest vertical. It's going to be a multi-billion dollar business. Like the future stars a decade from now are going to be gaming streamers and gaming creators. You would have literally been insane to predict that. No one did. No one even remotely did. My thing was just kind of looking one step in front of me and seeing, I just think other people are going to enjoy this. And so let's just, that. why can't that just be enough, right? And why can't that be enough to kind of work on it and think of it? And so in that regard, I saw a lot of parallels of 
it's it, you don't no one knows what it's going to look like in the future nobody has a crystal ball um you don't it doesn't really matter what other people thought about what it can or can't be for that reason and if it was like something you enjoyed doing and just kind of like pushing the ball like the ball you know up, up the hill that that was enough for me and so yeah those were super similar uh in that regard I think it's interesting looking at the catalyst of this too, like the gaming industry. A lot of that's like Xbox Live. When that took off, you started playing with your friends, you got community. And then like the iPhone allowed for people to look at videos on their phone. And then with that, you had social media. And Ryan, I'd like yeah. you to talk like how big of a deal was social content for gaming and like the growth of esports? Mo mobile in general was a huge moment for YouTube, like for a lot of reasons, because when when I was um, when I was at Machinima, all of the views were coming from desktop, right? And so I do think this thing of, of, of social sharing that you could just watch something on your phone instead of having to sit down on your computer, then open up this YouTube video and so forth really was monumental. Um, and so when we, get, so when we started seeing mobile pick up and at, and that inflection point when mobile viewership passed desktop viewership, obviously that pushed mobile ads and stuff for us to focus on you, that was a catalyst for a lot more viewership just because of the sharing. Uh, if, if nothing else, gaming had already been on that path where more and more people were gaming um, there's still to this day a little bit of the stigma and taboo of, you know, gamers are just like these people that play these video games in basements. It's, it's, I think more and more people are becoming a little more aware of how gaming shows up in our lives in so many different ways and how it's, it has evolved. Like when you're playing Doom or Quake, it was a little bit more of that hardcore in the basement culture. Games have now expanded to appeal so much more broadly on so many more devices. And so I think that helped normalize like more of a social norm if you will which helps obviously with growth and users you're at youtube you're the head of gaming at youtube you're working with kind of these legends uh at google some of the earlier pioneers of, of industry and then you make the decision to go to crypto <laughs> <laughs> what what happened there what's the story there yeah so you know we at when i was at youtube we were kind of looking at this like really interesting idea it, this is metaverse kind of buzz and and there was some Inside of the buzzword, there was a little bit of an interesting subject that was happening that I was just interested in looking at. It was two things. One, it was just like seeing how much money people were spending on video games, like digital item ownership and how much was going into that, um, which as a hardcore gamer, I was just fascinated. I spent a lot of money on games. No, that's like a trend. And then two, YouTube gaming had benefited so much from games, right? Obviously, you know, people play these games, they go watch the content. But there's only a finite amount of time that somebody has in their day. And so there was this kind of interesting conundrum where, yes, Minecraft, Roblox, these games made YouTube. But in a day where you have, you know, six hours to watch videos and, and play video games, if that gaming starts to become more appealing, it cannibalizes the, like, the viewership time. And so it's almost like, oh, it helped us get where we are, but now it's actually problematic. So just going down this rabbit hole of exploring, well, what does that mean next for YouTube? What does it mean for gaming in general? Let me down crypto and blockchain and digital asset ownership. I had, I never, it, like my background, not really in, like watching uh, crypto from the sidelines with maybe some level of intrigue, but no, I didn't really like the Bitcoin white paper, you know, you know, have this kind of like libertarianism thought and be like, I'm going into it and it's going to change the world. But what I started to realize with digital ownership was, and we're going to keep spending money on this. This system that we have right now for it is not going to work, right? Because there's not enough autonomy, fluidity on like how we actually do these things. And so that kind of led me into the space, invested in Immutable, right? Um, then just thought I was going to just advise Mer. Like, honestly, I was like, this is, I got a dream job over here. I'm not fucking with this crypto space. I'm going to stay over here um, and just advise. But the problem with that is, it, once you want that whole like red pill concept is real. Like once you actually start to see some of these things and 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 believe in like a future state of what it could look like, it's very hard to go back from that. And so and 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 it's so dynamic the space on a day to day basis. I felt like I just had to jump all in, right. burn the ships behind me, and you know hope for the best. Yeah, I gotta I gotta like double down on that because you jumped over. I'm sure a lot of your friends in the industry are like, what are you doing? Um, you came oh, over. Man. It's probably like pretty <laughs> exciting, right? And crypto is exciting depending on the day. It moves very quickly. Um, have you had like an oh shit moment? Like, why am I here? Like, what am I doing? Like specifically, like what is something you came to crypto and you saw it and you're like, what's going on? Why, Dude, why? I've had a hundred oh shit moments in the yeah. two years I've worked full time in this space, right? Um yeah, I think look, um, one thing I when I come when I came when I came from Google, like Google is what I knew, right? Because I was there so long. So there was just like a there was a type of person, a way of doing business 
that Google has plenty of flaws, but they also have done what they've done and like there's some merit there. And so all of what you learn at Google, both how the business operates, right? Wall gardens, generate revenue, capture users. Some of it is just like completely contrarian on, on the Web3 ethos side, right? And so you you are one battling that, right? Like a lot of people that work in Web3, like everything that Google does is what they think is like what's wrong with the space. So you're one, I, there was way more of maybe not resentment there, but like that's, we're not trying to be that. Like we're trying to go against that. So that was like a big one of, you know, a little bit of like a jump into the, the cold water I, I learned quite quickly and both internally and externally. Some of it being very valuable, some of it maybe not as far as like merit or not. Two, tribalism I was actually all good with. Like I noticed that how hardcore that was, but I actually kind of like that. Like I saw it with YouTube versus Twitch and stuff. I love that community, like rallies behind products and platforms, feels passionate about it, um, speaks their mind, has a bunch of candor. I don't like when employees or founders or execs participate in the tribalism like at all. Like the space is very small, but I actually loved that. And it was really cool to see how hardcore that was. I learned a lot from it. Actually, that's kind of, I learned about, you know, Mert and stuff too. Um, and then the, the, the thing that I think bothered me the most, um, which actually this, the only time I ever thought about leaving crypto and like wanting to get out of it was the, just the, the leaders when I came into the industry were horrific, quite frankly. And like people love them. VCs love them. People I respect dearly, love them. The community love them, like Doquan and SBF and all these different people. Um, and look, you don't have a crystal ball on some of these things that like SBF may have done or whatever, but these people and the way that they carried themselves on a day-to-day -day basis from interviews to social media, it was not reflective of what I thought the leadership within the industry really needed to be. That's not to say there's great, there's fantastic leaders in this space, um, you know, but I, I, the ones that were particularly on a pedestal very uniquely, that was troubling. I've, I think we've, you know, we have as an industry have learned from that and you're, we're moving away from that. But when I first joined, that was, they were like religious figures when I first joined, which was really bizarre. Yeah, certainly the industry has a problem with idolizing, uh, corrupt individuals or people who are maybe a bit more um uh uh sketchier than than um we, we we should probably be aiming for so you are just going back to the story here so you you are you know you're interested in basically like how how much money people are spending um on on kind of these digital assets the metaverse stuff you are an advisor in immutable x which uh for people who don't know is is a is a, is a roll-up that's gaming focused um, I believe Polygon might have joined forces with Immutable X recently, but I don't, yep. I don't think that was the yeah. case at the time. Not, not um, at the time. Yeah. And okay, so how does how did you come to work? Or actually, you were the CEO president of, of Polygon Studios. How did that came to be? What's the story there? Yeah, you know, so I was going to I was going to kind of help Polygon from an advisory standpoint, from a gaming perspective, and just really started spending a lot of time with Sandeep. And just, you know, I was like, life's pretty short in general. I've always felt that I do kind of the greatest work where I'm most passionate uh, and feel like I can have highest impact. And it just really started to occupy my mind of, I'm going to miss out by not not going down this avenue. And it felt very much like how I felt about YouTube and gaming video and all of these different things, um, kind of like what we touched on. And so I just, I just was like, I got to do it. And so we spent more time talking about, well, what's... They had just raised their $450 million Sequoia-led fund, uh, or investment rather. They acquired three different ZK teams. So it was this idea of like, okay, there's an opportunity for me to help this group. Um, I can learn from this group. I can help. Like, it's a great opportunity for me. And so I came in as Polygon Studio CEO. Studios was a division of, let's say, the foundation, if you will, of Polygon. It was a, a, a company that was going to focus on you know NFTs and gaming and metaverse and all of these different things. You then had kind of the three different ZK tech teams fully solely focused on infrastructure. Then you had Polygon Tech at the time, which was kind of like a hodgepodge of the POS team, some BD team, some marketing folks, right? Like that is kind of like, I've always looked at the, the legacy Polygon team, pre-studios and the ZK teams, right? Um, so I come into that and I start building out the studios team, you know, hiring who, who's now like our COO of Polygon Labs and like, you know, building that team out. Um, our BD team, all of that. And it was really fun. Like the the there was a ton of opportunity in the space. 
we couldn't, like, we had, we like people were calling left and right as far as opportunities to work in Web3. I mean, it's very different times, right? Um, and so that was what I was doing at studios. And ultimately, we decided that we need to roll all of these different groups up under one team, which we then did last summer uh, under Polygon Labs. Ryan, when you were hiring over that team, now that you've been in crypto for like you know, two years or so, what have you learned from hiring crypto native people versus looking at talent from Web 2, bring them to Web 3? Oh, man, we could do a whole hour just on this. Um, this is really interesting. And I actually leaned on some of my learning experience from my YouTube days because when I was at YouTube, I, I was like, we got to hire people from outside Google that I actually understand gaming creators and video, but we can't just be that that group of like, Game, hardcore gamers coming into Google because they're just going to reject us entirely. Um, you know, the only way that, 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 that the tissue will be accepted is if we bring some internal Googlers in as well who can kind of show us. So I did a mixed hybrid of building out the YouTube gaming team of externals and internals. Um, and that worked out really well for everybody. It kind, there's a lot of similarities, but but differences as well. So try to do that same kind of model when I came over into to Polygon. Some worked out, some didn't. The, the things that didn't work out is like in the Web2 side, in that category, they really aren't bought in on this is a finite amount of time to work for a protocol to launch a decentralized network. This is, you are not going to work. This is not Google. We are not going to grow to some large 40,000 employee team. If you want to manage a team of 30 people one day, it's not going to be here, right? Like, you have to understand the mission. The mission is you're going to build this network out. You're going to like push it out to sea and you're going to give it to the people. And you're done then, right? And so that is a hard thing for a Web2 person to wrap their head around because it's completely opposite of going to a, 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 like a startup company that you hope is going to be a rocket ship that's going to like make your name and build your career out. Because it's not it. It's not it. So with Web2 folks that came in thinking that this was the next... Microsoft, Google, Amazon, that it was going to build out to these large forces. It was a huge miss. And so I wish I would have, when I would speak to people from Web2, be like, but do you, but do you actually understand what I'm saying when I say all this and why this is? Um, and then on the Web3 side, uh, stubborn, like if you're too stubborn, too naive, like not willing to open up to different ways of doing it, of how you bring people along is built with a lot of compromise and listening and understanding and, and, and not, you know, being hard headed or stubborn or all these things. And so, look, I'm, I'm being very general in describing these two camps, but these were threads that were very common inside of them that you had to be very mindful about when hiring. And that was a huge learning experience for me. Yeah, I think like probably one of the biggest surprises is especially in foundation level roles, it's almost like working for a government or like a nonprofit uh, where it's like you're kind of serving the citizens and the citizens kind of hate you um, mm -hmm. and you're, you're not really making money. And, and uh, anyway, so um, talking about maybe the the mix of this hybrid Web 2, Web 3 cultures, you are probably most well known, I would say, um, at least in my circles, as the prolific kind of BD guru. Like you're very good at... <laughs> you know, the brand uh, partnerships, pushing kind of the top down approach of how like Web2 businesses, enterprise sales, stuff like that happens. Um, and as you mentioned before, that approach, you when you entered the space first, you were kind of surprised or maybe not surprised, but you saw that maybe some of the uh, internal Web3 people were maybe somewhat against that. Uh, despite that, I would say that Polygon probably still has the biggest reputation for just being good at BD. Uh, and, and landing these deals and kind of being on the table when people talk about enterprises and whatnot. What do you, how do you view like this concept of BD in, in the context of crypto and Web3? Um, maybe some lessons you've learned along the way as well. Yeah, I think um, it's, I mean, it's such a great topic, also fascinating and unique in our space. Um, a couple things. I think from an outside perspective, like there's two really important verticals that you have to focus on. There is Web3 native developers, maybe a gross term or however you want to categorize it, but like true people that are going to build and understand like intuitively what crypto is, what it can be, what blockchains are. And then you've got a group of people that are intrigued. They might varying degrees of understanding it, maybe some from, from nothing to a good amount, like Starbucks, good amount, maybe other ones like Coca-Cola just wants to do like a cute NFT project and everything in between. 
And so you have to have two different groups set up to handle these two different groups. When you go talk to X Fortune 500 company, it's polished top to down. You need complete end to end polish because that's what they deal with. You know, when Salesforce goes in or Starbucks, people roll out the red carpet, Google, any of them. And what does that look like? It's I'm going to hold your hand through your entire experience here. When it's negotiating the deal to tech questions that you have, to how you onboard, to how you think about Web3 native marketing, to how you go to market and anything in between. And then once you're on the platform, you know, the protocol, we're going to make sure you're happy. This is very Web2. And this should only be for a finite amount of time in crypto. Like this is kind of the introduction screen of a video game. I'm going to give you the tutorial run through. This is like, blockchain. So this is crypto and this is the space. And you need to do that, right? Because that's the that's where we're at at this point in the industry. I don't know that this serves as a true future uh, state of BD, because when you think about protocols and you think about, you know, you know, uh, proposals being put forth and where, you know, tokens come from and how you fund these deals, I believe there will be a high degree of transparency. And in one day they will be more community owned and operated. But the reality is you're looking at like a web 2.5 kind of BD team to handhold these folks. The question would be like, why, 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 who gives a shit about these companies? Like, that's not what's going to make or break our future. I would say brand sentiment is really important. If you look at like, you know, you're running all of crypto, you got to work on brand sentiment right now. It's an absolute F. It's in the toilet, right? And so it wasn't even that great two years ago, but obviously it's only declined. And so things where you can bring in big enterprises or big companies and actually illustrate interesting things, even if it is faux Web 3, Web 2.5, is good brand sentiment driving. It is not going to be what makes like crypto in the future. It is not going to be the breakout app and experience. It's not going to generate hundreds of millions of users for these protocols, but it's going to help with sentiment. When you start to improve sentiment at a macro level and at a protocol level, developers become interested in the space. So yeah, maybe it's like Starbucks and Salesforce Enterprise. It's like, eh, that's anti-Web3 <laughs> ethos. Developers that are more logical, I think, that are looking at this in a more even-killed way, thinking long-term, do see value in that. But that's not enough, right? So then like all of a sudden, what else can you do? Which is why then you need, one, a Web3 native team, and you need a disproportionate amount of money to go towards that group. So if you think about like those two groups, that Web2 Enterprise group, we did BD deals. But the amount that was spent in that group versus the $100 million fund being deployed to all kind of native Web3 developers, this pales in comparison. A vast majority, 80 plus percent of you know the distribution is happening in this Web3 native group. And long term, that's where success is going to come from. But I always felt you had to do them in parallel because you you have to improve sentiment because you need to attract people. Full stop. Users, brands, developers, everybody, because you want, like, what do people want at the end? They want a lot of transaction volume on a network so that it inevitably can be self-sustainable. I couldn't agree with that more. I love that you're so practical about all this. Um, okay, so when you're dealing with Nike, Starbucks, and these other big brands, and also just builders in the space when you're at Polygon, what are they actually asking when, when they're coming onto the ecosystem? Like, are they asking you about the tech stack? Is that really what they care about? Do they care about the other brands that are there? Or like, yeah, what are they looking for? I, I mean, it's so it, it depends. Like, look, you've got people like a Visa or Starbucks who are they have teams that are focused on this, that they get it. Th they are going to go deep on tech related questions and they have a bunch of questions they need asked. And so you want to be able to serve them with an appropriate forum, people, time, structure to do that. Then you've got people that, you know, it's like the marketing guys taking a chance on Web3 metaverse buzzwords. He has no idea what he's doing, but he's like, would be cool, right? You know, like I heard people are talking about NFTs um, and to that. And so you've got to make decisions on how do you value time relative to these groups, right? Time, money, energy, resources, because these things can be cumbersome. Like if you spend too much time, you got three, four people working on some like low level NFT project with a big brand, but it's not going to do anything. That's a waste of time. Like, like is brand sentiment driving that incremental by doing this project? Or is this like really wasting our company resources that we should be doing other things? These, you know, you have to make those judgment calls, but it's everything in between that they need. And so you kind of, what you know, I always like doing, and I'm, I'm much more like structured and principled in the way, you know, that I, I like to do things is deal review, BD deal review on a category and invite everybody. 
Like it's open forum. Anybody can come, you can come. We're going to talk about it way in, right? And at the end of the day, consensus on, is this worth our time? Is it worth our money? Is it worth our energy? And it's good for BD folks to weigh on this, product folks to weigh in on it. You're never going to get everybody fully aligned. Maybe there's big opportunities where everyone is like, we got to go do that, which obviously gives you more conviction then. Um, but it's good because you learn from it. Um, you get more, you know, like everybody is in it because if you don't do it that way, you start to make business related decisions that product teams resent. And that creates like a lot of toxicity inside of a culture because like they're not aligned on some of these things philosophically. While you just mentioned the, uh, the, the metaverse guy, uh, maybe, oh, this would be cool. Um, it kind of reminded me of something. And, um, so you, you obviously have this unique background that you're not only, uh, head of a very you know, prominent crypto company, but you were also head of gaming at YouTube. And so you're one of the few people who've actually done high level Web2 gaming or just gaming and crypto. And it seems like there is a weird particular dislike from gamers towards NFTs, right? So I believe Mr. Beast has something called like the Creator League or something yeah. where one of the guys found out that there was actually NFTs and he's like, oh, I cannot support this technology. <laughs> What is that about? Like, why do why do gamers just vehemently hate NFTs? One, I love that guy. That guy, by the way, has been anti NFT all the time. So the fact that they even picked him was not smart to begin with. Like, he's been very passionate about his perspective, and that's cool. I, I, I like, Burr, you know, I love hearing everybody's opinion. So, um, yeah, look, gamers absolutely hate NFTs. Like, absolutely hate it. Um, more than anything ever. Like I hear a lot of people, well, you know, they hated mobile gaming, they hated free to play. They did, but they really hate NFTs, you know? Um, so it is unique. I think NFTs, look, from an outside perspective, you just like stop and look at NFTs as a gamer. You're like, I just like playing my video games, like buying my skins and shit, I like playing with my friends. Then you look over the like over the lake and you see these guys trading hundred thousand dollar monkey JPEGs, like wag me GM join my discord, blah, blah, blah. And there, and, and then you've got people pitching like concepts that are not even, don't even make sense. Like I remember I saw somebody like Lincoln park dude or whatever. was like, what if you could take your, you know, your AK 47 in this game and like take it up just like terrible thoughts, terrible illustration. So their first introduction in NFTs was incredibly toxic, like rugs, scams, and then behavior that they don't understand. Like, I don't know, punk, I, I get it. I love it. Like, but you can certainly be empathetic being on the other side of being, I don't want whatever the shit you guys are doing over there. Do not bring it into my video games. And I think that's the depth of it. Like, I think we overcomplicate. And it's largely a Western issue too, by the way. Like, we are a little bit of an echo chamber, particularly in the West on some of this. Um, but you can understand why there's hate. And you need to be able to show people like what it is that it's going to actually drive value for them. And the industry hasn't been able to do that yet. And I, I believe that it will, but I'm okay with the resentment towards it. In fact, I'd even call it fair because the industry has not produced something to change their mind. They're not evangelists. They're not going to go read about blockchains and networks and decentralization and how this is going to change their lives. It's not their responsibility to do it. Nobody, 99% of people will never do that, that use the tech that they touch, you know? Um, so until you put something in their hands that changes their minds, I think it's going to be that way. Yeah. And like, I find it interesting because you could argue Ethereum started because of gaming, right? Like Vitalik had this moment where um, I think he was playing World of Warcraft or something. And like the game developers just kind of changed the rules or some of the items or something. And he just got angry and he, he just, you know, started on this path of like sovereignty and whatnot. And so there's actually some common um, kinship, let's say, or at least ideals um, but you said, you know, it's not, this is not going to change until you put something in their hands that that'll change their mind. What do you think that, I mean, obviously that's a hard question, but like, how do we change that? Uh, what are, what are some, some of your thoughts on this? Ryan, yeah. before, before you go, Ryan, I got to jump in because I hate that Vitalik story, which I don't think is real, Mert. I don't know if it is. I don't think it is. The other thing, Ryan, maybe in this, this answer you can put in there is people talk about taking their assets from like one game to the other. And that's, it goes back to Vitalik, like his sword was no longer worth, you know, what it originally was on like skill points. Well, even in crypto, if you have an asset from a certain game, that game can still just shut down. Right? Totally. Like, yeah, that blockchains wouldn't fix the wow issue that he experienced at all. Like, in fact, 
Counter-Strike, right? Okay, so like they, you own a knife and I want to rant on Counter-Strike on your point, Bert, as well. One, because it's like, I've spent way too much time since, you know, the last month playing Counter-Strike 2 since the beta came out. But there's a lot of things to, to unpack there. You know, even Counter-Strike where you own the knife, they just made an update like graphically to some of the knives and it decreased their value because aesthetically they look different. So the game developer can do that. Even if those assets were all on chain, the underlying asset could still change, right? They could be like, yeah, I'm gonna update this, you know, file, right? That, yeah, I have Garrett owns it, but I'm updating it. And now it's not gonna look the same in a, in a game. So yeah, Garrett still owns it, but it looks different. So there are things that I don't think blockchains like fundamentally change. I would say when you talk about it, I like to just kind of like have more, not simplified dialogue, but actually get into it. And I think of like, just look at, one thing that I think is interesting is, Game, big games that are driving a disproportionate amount of that like digital revenue, um, they come from like this like games as a service, platforms as a service, whatever you want to kind of call this category. You, know, you look at Counter Strike. I think they launched the um, they launched their marketplace in 2013. Um, since 2019, they've made 32 billion dollars. Well, they've generated like 32 billion dollars of transactions have occurred on the marketplace, like pretty significant. And this isn't even a top game. Like if you look at Fortnite, Roblox, Minecraft, and so forth, obviously a really big tactical shooter has been around since 99. But in Counter-Strike, what can you do, right? So I can go in, uh, I can buy it. I can buy a knife in aftermarket on Steam. I can sell it inside of that market. They'll keep the money inside of Steam. So what does that create? Well, it's created now third-party websites, right? Like Skinpore, you know, CS Float, all these different companies. So now you go to this like third-party website, and they basically are like escrow for these digital items. But you can get money out. You KYC, right? So you go through the same kind of process. Uh, you link your Steam account. You link your bank account, right? You then have the item. They verify the items, kind of like history. They verify like what percent fade and uniqueness and rarity it is. And they display all this stuff. And so you can go up there and I've got this bayonet fade knife. And I can go sell it to Mert and all this stuff. They take you know 2% transaction fees. During the trade, they do, you know, whatever, 1%, 2% when you withdraw, all of that. Pretty good system, right? Like, you got to have this, you know, it's like, it's not perfect, but, right, it's good. Um, I use it, I love it, I think it's, it's, it's fine. So I've asked myself, if you really believe, like, digital assets and stuff need to be on blockchains, well, what is missing, right? Like, this is where the rubber meets the road on the conversation. And so from a product features perspective, forget blockchains, crypto, this is just like what I want if I could create a product that I would want. I want to know the history of these items. Who owned them? Did Mert like play in an ESL championship game with this AK-47? And like, do I own it now? I want a record keeping history of who owns these items because it would change it. Like Garrett, who's not good at it, Counter-Strike with his little knife, but might be the same knife as Mert's. I'm going to look at Mert's like more valuable because he, you know, killed somebody with this weapon in one of the tournaments too. I'd dominate Mert. Yeah, so I want to know that. Um, I want to know that it can never be taken from me, right? Like I might get, you know, maybe I had a rough night and I was like talking shit to Mert in Counter-Strike and I get banned and I lose my item, right? Or something like that. I want to be able to just know I own it. Even if there's no nefarious malicious behavior that I plan on doing, I just want to know that I own it. Well, why do you want it to know you own it? I want to sit in some kind of wallet where all my items from all my games are. Well, why do you want that? Because say I want to watch, you know, Counter-Strike on YouTube and they can see how many skins I have. They can know I'm a Counter-Strike fan. Say Call of Duty Warzone wants to advertise for user acquisition and say, hey, if you own, you know, these three skins in Counter-Strike, we'll give you this rare one over here. Come play our game, right? I, you know, what? so what can you do on some of these systems? Well, you can kind of create OAuth. You could OAuth, Activision ID and Steam. You're going to do that across every single game. Steam, it, no, because it's not in their interest to do that level of data sharing between the organizations and give that out. But because they don't want to do that and don't want to give it out, why don't they want to do that? Because that really benefits gamers and users and it takes power away from them, which is the point of all of it, right? It is like, we need to like have a more distributed balance of power between X company and X user in a lot of these, these scenarios. And so right now, the system that I want ha it is best served on, on blockchain and on crypto, right? Being able to do you know, trades, being able to rent my items out, being able to like show I own them for other reasons. Then you can kind of take this in a number of places. Like I think about, I wish Delta knew my, you know, American Airlines status so that I could switch over there. And like, just because I show all of my status in my wallet, I can just like log in with my wallet and they can see that status. And so I put a big premium on things need to sit in a digital wallet 
The things that they are sitting on need to be sitting on a network that's not owned on, by anybody. And I can do a number of things with these things. And so long-winded, this is my rant about Counter-Strike. It gets me far. It does get me far in a web 2.5 system using like a centralized database and so forth, but it doesn't get me where I want from a product standpoint. So my take is this. I want that. I think it's better for gamers. I think it gives better power distribution to gamers. If you don't need crypto and blockchain to do it, then do it, fine. But I would say from my understanding and how I've spent a lot of time looking at it, good luck because it's really hard to build out those systems and it requires a ton of BD work because it's not just like smart contracts. Now it's you're doing long onerous deals between Activision and EA to do account linking and share these things. And why is it in their best interest to do it? You're not. So yeah, this is my my big thing I want to see differently. And that's my, the, game, that's my gaming example. I love the um, example of Counter-Strike. We used to actually play that in like Turkey and like internet cafes with like LAN parties and Half-Life 2 and like we would switch accounts and uh, for like different games and, and sell those back and forth. Yes, big. Um, yeah, especially big in like just maybe the underdeveloped uh, countries. Um, so, okay, you, you you talk about the dynamic needs to change, maybe the power dynamic from the creators of the game and then the players of the game, the gamers. How do we, what is the, like, what is the first step? How do we actually make that happen? Because, well, one, gamers kind of hate NFTs and they probably hate crypto to begin with. And then it's in the interest of the creators to not do that. So, like, what, what is the missing piece there? How, how will it happen? Yeah, it's going to be a great game. Like Counter-Strike, phenomenal game, dude. Been around since 99. They've done, like, engine updates, you know, different, you know, di maintain the integrity of the game, but different iterations as it's, you know, gone on. And that's what CS2 is. There's not great games yet. Like, be honest with yourself. Like, truly, I'm a gamer. I'm down to look at any Web3 game at any time and play it. There is not great games. Now, there are ones I have found really interesting conceptually, like Pirate Nations on Polygon's on Arbitrum now, like pretty interesting uh, makers of Farmville. Conceptually, everything is, like, is cool because it's like all, everything is on chain. Literally every single action that is taken is on chain. Now, is that necessary? I don't know, but I find it to be fascinating to learn from. Um, and But there's no good games. I mean, look at it. And then the thing about it is all this capital. So last year, between Polygon and Immutable, the amount of capital deployed on games that are building on one of those two stacks was one and a half, two billion dollars, something like that. Not from Immutable or Polygon, but like VC backed funding that went towards Web3 games. The interesting thing now is how many of those games are pivoting back into Web2? Probably a decent amount, right? That are like, oh, we're going to the blockchain crypto thing and wait, right? Uh, we're going to just like make a good game first. And then out of those that remain, how many of them are going to be good games? Because at the end of the day, if a gamer is just like, it's a good game. And all of a sudden, they're like, oh, shit, I can do these things. Like, I can do this. And it's like, it, like the experiences just have to unfold and happen. The problem with betting on games being the catalyst for blockchain and crypto is good games take a very long time to make. And this has gotten harder over the years, right? Because the ex uh, they, like one, there's so much capital that has been injected into video games that there's so many games, whether they're out now or coming. A lot of the games, the, the top games own a disproportionate amount of market share. Um, and so like getting people off those games to play their games is becoming increasingly difficult. And there's just, you know, like, again, it goes back to that finite amount of time. But at the end of the day, it, it's not actually that complicated. You just like make a really great game. Gamers will start to play it and they'll just start to interact. Um, the infrastructure rails and Mert, I, I saw your tweet, like about the UX thing. I actually think really could, if you had a good game, I do think, you know, you could overcome some of these UX UI hurdles that we see in the space, but it's still kind of like a shitty experience of like, oh, you know, I'm going to create this wallet and C phrase and then I got to link it over here. And then like I go to a phishing scam and it's gone. So we've kind of got like we have some work to do. It will take many years to do. Um, but that is what will happen. And it doesn't even need to be a high fidelity. Like look at Minecraft is what changed YouTube for gaming. And that game looked like complete shit when it first came out. And not like a graph, a high graphical game, but even the base layer of that game was like very basic in a lot of ways, but fascinating in others. Totally changed YouTube gaming forever. 
I, I have like two two questions, but pick one of these because I think they're both a little bit tangential. So one of them is you were talking about you could have assets from a game, let's just say Fortnite, and then you're in Call of Duty and they can see that you have those assets, for example. And maybe they give you like um, the keys to a beta of the next game coming out. So it's like some type of like token gated access. Um, that reminds me of like marketing and advertisements and attribution. I'm curious like how you think about because like YouTube's business model is advertising, right? Like do you see that coming into Web3? So that's that's kind of question one you can run with. And, and the other one is, do you think like generative AI changes all of this when it comes to NFTs and Web3? Because yes, there's like, now for the first time you can have, let me figure out how to word this. With NFTs, you can limit supply, but the whole thing holding back a lot of games is creativity and creating these NFTs. But if you have generative NFTs, like does that even matter anymore? Because you're just going to have this unlimited supply of creative assets. <laughs> Man, those are you know the second one's like a is a is a tough loaded question. Um, look, I think with generative AI, I think at the end of the day these are tools, and then the way that we use these tools change. That it doesn't like people that talk about it alienating or seizing these things to exist I, it, is tough for me because I look at like, they are tools that are going to enhance development. It will change roles. It will change positions. It'll you have to change maybe expertise and things that you do. But at the end of the day, these are not going to like replace people. I think people will get into other areas of expertise and it will continue to use all of these technological tools as just that, right? So one, then it talks about the artist, right? So it is you know manual and cumbersome to create all of these arts and these assets and so forth, right? And so removing that. Does the artist still have value? Yes, it just will be displaced and utilized differently than that, right? Like having an overall aesthetic or going in and changing some of these assets, like there's still work to be done there. I do think it will help amplify people's work. Like I think you'll be able to do bigger things with smaller teams. Awesome. I think that's like a great outcome. Now, if you go into AI, like further than just generative art and how that's changing gaming and, and it will have an influence on the games industry in a meaningful way, Long term, there's also like AI and how it's used with NPCs and stuff. Like you'll have way more immersive game experiences when your NPC is actually able to communicate and think about it. That can affect storyline based off of dialogue. That's also happening right now. Like a company called Gardens is doing that. Um, so these these things will be big breakthroughs. I do believe in the game space and will change the games industry. But I think generally for the better and creating new experiences. AI is a little bit of a different beast, but I do think blockchains and like you know having that like there's some level of authenticity of like you know source material news right remember like the there was that that incident where they said like there was a, a explosion at the pentagon and stock market you know crumbled like if you could verify authenticity of some of these things because of generative AI, ai like and and the underlying like image of like the new york times are all minted on a blockchain and so when you see something from like new york times publication if to, to verify it's real i think like blockchains can serve a purpose there obviously two different things but relative to ai Ryan, what do you think? Do you think there are certain verticals within gaming that fit into crypto better than others? So, for example, I'm personally a big fan of like card games, uh, you know, like the Hearthstones or maybe even NBA Top Shot to an extent, um, or like you know, games where you like manage uh, maybe like a team or like a car, and you get to like buy the pieces, put it together, etc. Like horse racing, I don't know, something like that. Do you think? Because you said like maybe the the core thesis of Web3 for gaming is maybe shifting the power balance between the creators and the gamers. Do certain verticals within gaming, like genres of games, fit Web3 better than others? Or do you think, you know, do, are they all the same? It's funny. Um, yes, I do. I think some of the game categories that got manipulated early on are like pay to win. So I think card games, not all card games, a lot of card games are pay to win. Um, then you looked at even like some of the issues with like Diablo three and the auction house was just like pay, put pay to win, you know, Di Diablo Immortals, like very pay to win. I, I love, by the way, I love all of those games. Um, uh, it just, it is what it is on those games. I think it, it attracts like crypto attracts those categories, but I don't like that. Right. I don't think that's like where the interest is best fit. I go back to these, like more of these open economies and marketplaces is like the natural fit and places where you can do UGC. So like a Roblox where you can create mods or game modes or maps or whatever. How do you like monetize those? How do you own those things? How do you share revenue with those things? Uh, how do you think about the like owning digital goods and items, kind of like our Counter-Strike conversation? These games where money, it, it, it's not like money doesn't influence out, like game outcomes, but actually the ecosystem itself. So like Counter-Strike would be sweet if you could have like, 
you know, one of your favorite NFT artists drops like a mint of, you know, M4s, right? I'm dropping a thousand M4s. I did the the skin, the graphic skin for the M4, you know, and if, and those that hold, you know, this X NFT that I've already done, you're going to get like a part of that drop as well. Right. And they're like, you know, if you look at the, um, gosh, what's the, the artifact guys, those guys started as like Counter-Strike skins and stuff, right? You know, like that's their background. So I like, can imagine they, they were doing sweet stuff. So I think where you actually are leveraging these like UGC ecosystems and digital ownership is where the, the beauty is. And not to say card games can't be that. Like they certainly can, like Parallel and so forth are doing really cool stuff. It's just, I, I, I say cautiously, games where money dictates outcome always scares me with crypto because crypto will take advantage of that. Just inherently, I think it does. Ryan, have you been following the situation with Unity at all? So Unity um, is yeah. like a game engine. And essentially, they've had a hard time, I think, like monetizing a correct way because other people, other gamers and developers can essentially take their engine, develop games, or I think are often mobile with Unity. But they're having a hard time actually following up and ensuring that they're getting paid for that usage of their engine. And it's hard because you don't want to have a bunch of lawyers on your team go chase down these little apps. But when you do have someone succeed, it's like, oh, I actually need to get paid for this. And so what they're doing is they're actually trying to monetize by installs now instead of like what's actually going on in game and installs can be gamed right like an install doesn't mean that developers actually making any money well, and i and, think that's yeah, that's like terrible because marketing you want installs and so it's like counterintuitive right? then yeah yeah and so i feel like crypto could have um could find a way into gaming through this also like payments mechanism which is probably crypto's like best product market fit that we have right now um especially we're seeing a lot of momentum in solana but i'm hoping like if you do have these different creators and designers developing like whatever it might be like new assets or designs for you know your gun and call of duty um it could be a way to have a simple interface to make these payments actually connect and like track usage i don't know if you've seen that ryan in gaming yet or is that just like a theoretical example? no i haven't seen it i mean i do think the i mean unity's got an interesting problem right it's like unity and unreal are mega giants in the game engine space, right? For different things from mobile to VR to, you know, whatever, right? Um, I do think there is something there on revenue sharing that could be like really unique and interesting. That's kind of even what I was implying by talking about, you know, Roblox or Minecraft and how you kind of stoke the developer, sub-developer ecosystem in there where they're doing mods and now they're creating value for, you know, Roblox because users are coming into that game. How does Roblox see value? How do they see value? And they've got a good system like YouTube does with creators and monetization. You know, a, a majority of revenue goes to creators for YouTube, right? So they've got to kind of figure out that. But installs is 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 really bad because I just think in general, you want game developers need to be able to promote installs as much as they can as part of their marketing and acquisition strategy and a lot of those might not mean anything. It's like you 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 go for all those installs to just sync one person, get that one person over the like 12 to 13 hour gameplay barrier where you can really start monetizing that user. And so when you take that away, you're basically taking away a funnel away from them. And so I I, I feel like they might have retracted that. I'm not up to speed on like the latest as in like the last 72 hours on Unity. But it's just not what they did is not going to work. So I imagine they will re they will rethink it. I just I don't see how it works like full stop, non starter. So and the, I love that unity team like really good people over there. So I think they have a they've got a tough problem. I don't think anybody in their right mind in web two is going to jump on crypto rails right now, um, nor should they but they have it's a little bit of a conundrum for them in this current moment. So we've talked about gaming a lot and, and BD. But Ryan, I mean, you, you talked about how when you were making the jump from YouTube to crypto, you weren't like the, you know, the Bitcoin white paper libertarian type. How have your thoughts on the industry evolved since then? Like now that you, you're no longer, you're just um, the, the president of Polygon Labs, you're an advisor. Um, what are your current thoughts on the industry excluding gaming? Like, it's do funny you think, that, yeah, go ahead. Oh yeah. No, I just think like coming out of you know, being at Polygon where you're just working day in and day out, like you're just to a flaw head down too much. One learning was like, I got to come up for air more and make sure that I'm like constantly recalibrating the way I think about the space. And obviously the last like, you know, month and a half has allowed me to do that. Um, we're in a really interesting time right now outside the obvious, right? Like obviously sentiment is as bad as it can be, might get a little bit worse, right? It's all good. Like we're, we're going to find where the, the bottom is. And I don't mean price. I mean like our darkest hour of the space, we're gonna we're gonna find out where that is, um, and I think we're getting close to it, thankfully. But we're gonna get there, um, and I think there's gonna be a number of things. One, we've spent 
and this is the space. Like think of how the amount of money at the infrastructure, and by that I mean L1, L2 layer, is insane. Uh, no reasonable person would ever be able to sit here and justify it's insane. Um, and I get it. It's the pursuit of what all of this, you believe in this stuff? Where's it going to get built, right? And so, of course, if I'm a money man, I'm putting it on the like the bedrock, right? Um, and so I do understand the thesis behind all of it, but that's going to go away. Like, yeah, a lot of these L1s, L2s sitting on funds, right? Like decent sized, you know, capital from fundraising with nobody. They're like, ghost chains um and you can't and now we're at the bottom you can't buy activity you do the airdrop shit you can do all that it's all short term right like in none of it you know it's like what when time actually comes none of that's real right and it's cool everybody gets to do their little like airdrop thing it's fun every network does it it's all part of the game right but at the end of the day that doesn't do anything so i think we're now those games are pretty much over right like obviously airdrop farmers and these other things will keep kind of doing on some of these other like uh ghost protocols and so we're going to see a huge consolidation. I think it's going to be great for the space. It's going to be great because talent is now going to be more concentrated across certain areas. Um, I think you'll have five, maybe six protocols, uh, you know, across the board that are really driving an outsized amount of, you know, traffic transactions, app development. This will now cause VC capital to, capital to move up a layer towards an app layer, which is where funding needs to keep happening. Infrastructure, I actually think, if you even think two years ago, and Mer, you're, the, you're like much more advanced on this, has come a, a significant way in 18 to 24 months and looking 12 months out, even more so. Like so what Solana is doing, Arbitrum, Optimism, Polygon, all these different folks have really good game plans over the next 18 to 24 months that will abstract away some of the, like the technical hurdles for a lot of developers to just focus on building great experiences out and great apps and like what they can do uniquely. That layer is going to need another injection of capital. Now, that's going to come from L1s and L2s that still have meaningful treasuries and users and a good infrastructure. So, like, who is that group? Who's that cohort? That'll probably be the group that survives and actually goes on to be a meaningful blockchain in 25, 26, 27. And then hopefully you get some kind of, like, resurgence in the space. VC capital comes back in at a developer layer. And now you start to see building happening. And these are where you have the breakout hits. Protocols are ready for it. So if I, if that was, like, my TLDR of how the next... 36 months play out. That's how I think it's going to play out. That's been something that I've like, not that it's that odd. Like, I think it's very obvious kind of that plan. Like, even if you disagree with it, it's not like a crazy thought, but stepping back and like truly observing where we're at without any bias, really without any kind of impulse, without any influence, like that is where I've netted out. Outside of gaming, what you're, I think you're investing on the side right now. So maybe you could talk about that some, but like what sectors interest you the most? And, um, I'm asking a double question here, but a lot of people loved pointing to applications that could bring in people that are gaming because gaming became this like almost the savior of crypto in people's minds. Like we need gaming to take off or crypto's done. And yeah. and to reference, like crypto has 3 billion gamers and the gaming industry is bigger than like entertainment and music. So I understand why people are saying that. But yeah, what, what else interests you? Like, do we need gaming to make DeFi work? Do you think we need DeFi to work to make gaming work? Or are those just two separate things? <sighs> yeah, I mean, um, I think... Gaming can be the savior, but it will play an instrumental part long term. But it's not like the ship to save crypto is not coming from games in the next 24 months. Like I do think it comes, but I don't think it's like the the here and now thing. Um, so what you just really have to like, what do you do to prepare for it? That kind of segues into I think DeFi is important because I do think having liquidity inside of protocols is like really important um, for a lot of these games to get going and being able to do the things that you want to do. So I, I do think you have DeFi. I feel pretty passionate that like DeFi needs to be an instrumental part of any protocol. Um, it can have varying degrees of what that means, right? But I do think that is a critical piece, um, you know, to have kind of that backbone of liquidity there. But, we'll, you know, we'll see. Time will tell on some of that stuff. But I think gaming is going to take a little bit longer for it to show up. I think, uh, like, thinking about gamers is great because gamers in general tend to be, like, more tech savvy, more progressive, like, more keen to drive new technical innovation. So I think gamers are going to be interested as this space kind of flushes itself out and weeds out some of the negativity and badness of it, that gamers will be interested, even if they're not, their first experience isn't necessarily gaming. Mm, that makes sense. Yeah, it feels like a lot of crypto. I mean, this, again, won't be the savior, but it's just about like aging into crypto adoption, because I've heard you say that like gaming right now is the number one source of community and entertainment for the younger generations. And also just like they're more online, right? Like if you're I don't know, 
at 76 and making laws right now, like you're not online much and you don't care about crypto. So, oh man, don't even get me started <laughs> about going to going to DC. Um, yeah, I mean, how you explain crypto, blockchain, gaming, and tech to somebody that's literally on a Motorola flip phone? I mean, <laughs> the barriers. I mean, I think I'm pretty good at like simplifying tech related. That's like what Google. If any Google taught me more than anything is like simplifying this stuff um, from a tech perspective. Man. Good luck, good luck, like bridging the gap there. It's like you can't even, you can't wrap their head around like Facebook and Instagram and stuff. So when you take them on a rabbit hole of like decentralization, it's it's pretty gnarly. Yeah. So Ryan, to to wrap it up before we do the rapid fire, I want to know just what's next for you. So you were at YouTube for eight years. You went to Polygon Labs as president. Now you're an advisor. But yeah, what's next? What are you looking to get into? Yeah, I, I, I've been spending time obviously thinking about this. Um, yeah, I've been doing the VC, I've been doing the angel stuff, which I love because I just love working with founders. I love interesting projects. That's cool to me. That has been great. Um, not a lot of my time, but great spending my time doing that. I kind of had to think about like what like what do I go back to gaming? Do I go back into big tech? Do I stay in the you know crypto side? What is it like? I, I do I go into VC because I love VC. Anybody that knows me knows I want to go into VC next or, or one day. Um, and I think ultimately my take on it is this. These are the most, these next like five to eight years are going to be the most formative years for blockchains, full stop. Like, and I also think when you think about the work on the underlying infrastructure, it is a finite moment in time, right? Like you, these things will get to a place where you're now focusing on the next layer of it. They are autonomously operating. And yet you have groups that'll do upgrades and all that. I'm not saying like work will forever be done on them, right? But like as a contributor group and like building and standing them up, this is a moment in time. Um, and I just have to participate in that. Like it's, I am super passionate about it. Like the one thing I've been able to kind of look at is why am I getting up every morning and like, what gets me really excited and where, and I keep getting drawn into this, like these topics, these conversations, these discussions, like this is where my energy is spent. Now I'm gaming a lot, but I think I've done so much in that my time already in life has been to that, that this feels like where I've got to put my energy and so I'm going to do something in the protocol space. Like, I don't know exactly what, but it just feels, I'm pretty sure on this, like, I don't know, I'm still thinking through it, but like where I stand today, this is it. Um, I do want to do VC one day. Like I'm super passionate about it, but I'm also 36 and feel like that's a one way door. And it'd be a waste of a lot of operating energy that I have. Like I'm, I'm really, I'm ready to put in like 12, 13, 14 hour days for this space for a while. Like I don't need the three and a half day work week yet. I want it one day, just not today. All right. Well, uh, that's that's good to hear that you'll be staying crypto. Definitely need as much time as we can. Um, totally, Raj, if you're listening to this, uh, you know what to do. Uh, <laughs> hit up hit up Ryan's DMs. <laughs> um, well, uh, let's let's have some fun. Let's do some rapid fire. Um, just going to ask some, you know, quick rapid fire questions and uh, just try to answer as quickly as you can, but feel free to expand if, if you think, you know, something need, needs additional nuance on like, on like Twitter. Cool. Um, okay, so imagine you are working at the machinima equivalent of crypto right now, and you are writing these letters to the crypto industry to improve, as you did with gaming once. What do you write? I think... Um, probably three main topics I would cover would be how, you know, how we operate with more harmony as an industry, uh, how we explain things in a way that's more universally and simplified and understood, um, and how we just focus on building compelling products, right? And, and try to like move away from a lot of the noise. And it would be something along those lines and, and and particularly I think the most important is aligning everybody like competition is really good I actually think that's how people get the best out of each other uh, but also a time and a place where like a little bit of camaraderie and alignment on you know some of these things would be good and that's that would probably be where I would be at now PlayStation or Xbox Damn. I mean I start I, <laughs> I obviously started PC gaming and that's like what I still do uh <laughs> I think PlayStation, I played a lot on Xbox, but PlayStation, I think is 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 where I would go on that one. But PC gaming, keyboard, mouse over everything, full stop, then PlayStation. Uh, your top three PC games ever? Uh, well, Counter-Strike, obviously, probably World of Warcraft and Team Fortress Classic. Ooh. Uh, okay. What 
three worst games you've ever played? Um, hated Call of Duty Advanced Warfare. <laughs> Lots Strong of agree. Like it. Like it. Um, I don't know, man. I've not really played bad games. I mean, I've gone only, I only get drawn into the good ones. Yeah. I really have not played <laughs> terrible games or allocated much of my time to it's a couple of like shitty Maddens that came out, you know, yeah. when I was in college, right? That yep. I was like not big on, but yeah. Hard to spend any time on bad games. And I'm such a creature of habit, dude. I've been playing Counter-Strike since 99, man. Like I go back to that. Oh, Valorant as well as a great PC game. That's the mm. credit. Oh yeah. I'm gonna keep going with the with the gaming theme. Uh Elden Ring or Skyrim? Ooh. Skyrim. Skyrim. Good. Incredible. Oh wow! You didn't even think about it. Um, okay. Um, your top five favorite crypto protocols, not in order. I particularly spend so much time looking at just like L ones and well, one I've I've found myself fucking around on GMX, and so Arbitrum has been fun. Um, like doing uh, um, small, long, fun, wild positions with pure boredom. Um. I think, obviously, I love Polygon. Love what Solana's been doing. Solana's great, man. I think, like, as an all L1, like, I was talking to somebody the other day and was, like, you know, and it, it definitely an ETH Maxi. And it's like, I think of, I think Solana's going to have this career of, it's like Microsoft, uh, you know, I, you have, like, IBM and, like, Apple's over here and, like, no market share. But then, like, really over amount of time, like, people really find something unique. And I think Solana's in that. So I love them. Um, I think the ZK Sync team is doing some really great stuff. Optimism, you know, yes, they get a lot of flack on the fraud proof stuff, but like, I do think the way that they're moving the space forward, some of the stuff that they've done with Coinbase, you can have whatever opinion you have on it. I think it's pretty interesting. I could probably go on, but I think like when I think of like the companies that are capturing my attention right now, I think it's those groups. Mer, I think one of our like goals should be to drop the alt L1 from like the, the dictionary when we bring up Solana. That is, <laughs> I think over we're... time it will, dude. Like this yeah. is such an like, insider jargon that I don't even think people, when you think five, six years from now, they're just going to be like, oh, it's that thing. Yeah. And and like, I don't know how much we're even going to focus on, you know, Ethereum. L1s, like, yeah, I do yeah. think Ethereum is yeah. going to be a big part of like this value layer. And like, I, I, I think it's going to be huge. Um, but that's not the end all be all. I don't want to get Mert started on another hour long conversation either. Like with your, <laughs> triggering comments, but yeah, Solana's Solana's here to stay. And like, you know, Tolly and Raj are great, great founders, great team. Like, I'm I'm pretty bullish on them long term being a part of this. And yeah, I agree. I don't think it's these alt L1, L2 stuff. It's just inside baseball. Yeah, that that and monolithic versus modular. We're going for integrated. Uh, Ryan, I got one for you. Okay, yeah. so you're getting you're getting into cooking, I believe. So if you're in the kitchen, what are you chefing up? What's your best? Oh, uh, I've been cooking. So cooking, golfing, and gaming have been my three favorite hobbies my whole life. Uh, well, most of my life, you know, since you know, 11, 12, 13 years old. Uh, golfing, I picked up way later during COVID, though. Um, I'm cooking. So honestly, dude, I've been hitting up a lot of dishes. Um, I think I probably will continue to focus most on like pasta dishes and I want to start getting into baking. So different breads, sourdough bread, so forth. Like that's been an area I haven't done enough of. So I'm going to keep spending some more time there. And it, you really have to make some like, there's like some sacrificial bread I've had to make where it's completely terrible because I didn't do it right. Um, so I'm going to keep working on that. So honestly, <clears throat> baking, I'm going to get really owned in on baking over the next couple of weeks um just in time for the holidays and then when i go back to work the amount that i can cook is like non-existent um, or at least not of any kind of high degree but i'm hosting left and right here man i've been chef whiz in the kitchen for friends and family and i'm having a blast doing it love it nice we should get you to come to breakpoint and uh cook us all be the chef i would <laughs> i'm down i'm down I, I love it honestly the best part of cooking is like doing it for other people and like i find that to be a really enjoyable part of it Ryan, if you had to pick one game in crypto to show your friends from YouTube to say, hey, check out crypto gaming, which game is it? Midnight Society, for sure. Dr. Disrespect's can you describe, game. Yeah. What, what, is, what is Midnight Society? Can you describe it? Just it's, like a, it's, a, it's like a battle royale. He's got a kind of a new term. It is slightly different. It's like an extraction game. Um, it's cool. It's kind of got... It's got like, you know, a Call of Duty meets like Daisy meets, you know, like a couple different, I guess, like a couple different kind of games inspired. Um, I think what they're doing is pretty cool. They're doing like 
uh, early access memberships were NFTs. So as the game gets more popular, you can resell them for higher price points. If you own one of the original like membership, like founder passes, you have a unique helmet and aesthetic that is like a one-to-one -to, -one to you. They're doing cool stuff of like what, what utility is inside of that membership pass. I think a big part of that is they want to do different passes. They want people to be able to like, if they if they participated early in the game, be rewarded for that as you know more attraction to the game, more users come in. I think because Doctor Disrespect is is behind the game, it's his studio. You know, people are more likely like other creators to play the game, be more open minded to the different aspects of the crypto part. It's very like it's it's a very small part of it. You don't need to be a, a, a crypto at all. Like you don't need to own an NFT. You can play the game free to play. They even like the access, you can just buy access to it, just standard credit card. And then there's this NFT component. I think that's cool. Like, I do think you baby step people into it. You know, like that's where gamers are going to start to get comfortable. And then we're not going to, we're not going to use NFTs as such a term. I hate, I hate the term Same. NFT. I yeah. hate it. Like, I hate it. I don't hate it because <laughs> people hate the term. It just yeah. is so silly of a term to use when you're just talking about like functionally, what does it do? It's mm -hmm. nonsense to kind of like, it's just all bad. So anyway, like I think when there's that that you know underlying item, um, like people will come around to that. All right. Uh, two final questions. Um, one is what do you think about friend tech? And two, you are a great operator, and crypto probably has, I would say, a pretty significant shortage of great operators. What is one piece of advice you would give to people in crypto? about operating, doing business development, um, and just what you've learned over the years and into maybe like one piece of advice. Yeah, I think that, so friend tech um, is a mess in a lot of ways as far as like behaviorally what it's doing. But like, if, you, if you're able to remove yourself from that, is, I think there is a unique few, like these things, like you have to explore, you have to try different things and keep iterating on it. And that team, it's in its infancy of whatever it's building. And like, they're making these updates, like changing terminology from like, you know, the like to keys and so forth, right? I like, look, I don't know if that's the team. I don't know the team. I don't know if that's going to be the group that breaks through. But tinkering with the social layer and figuring that out is really important. And this work, even if it will be built upon, like whether it's them that do it or another team, they will take the learnings of Frentech and what's happening right now in that space and build on it. Now, if it's just these membership passes that allow for chat rooms and obviously like what value you create in there dictates these prices, like there's gotta be a lot more work to be done there. But that's like my, I, I, I'm, I'm always somewhere in the, like, I like to be optimistic about things and that like people intend to do well. And so there's not a lot of that in the space. Like I think a lot of malicious and like nefarious behavior exists in the space, but people are genuinely trying things that there's no blueprint for. So like they, you don't know some of the effects that will be created from some of these things. So I'm, I'm encouraged. We'll see how it turns out, but uh, I would say a little cautious as well on the operator side. I think generally what we're missing is just more like, methodical, even keeled operators, right? Where it's too much of reaction of when things are great or when things are so down that like, oh, I'm going to go work in crypto is the next big thing. I'm going to go over here or like, oh, crypto's dead and everyone hates it. I'm going to get out of here. It's like, you've got to find yourself somewhere in the middle and you can't be impulsive because this space is so erratic with highs and lows. Your impulsivity allows you to react too much to either one when like things are great, it's, you know, you're on cloud nine and when things are bad, the world is over. Right. And so operators have to be able to do that. And I think it's really important, not just like being a leader in the space to do that, but I think those that you're going to attract to work for you are so emotionally affected by that erratic behavior, whether it impacts them financially, their families, when they go home and that's what they're dealing with. So when you just add on to that, like you amplify the already existing troubles and issues within the space. And so being even keel will allow that to kind of like distribute within your organization a little bit more so that you can be clear thinkers. Because if it is always wild, you will not make the best decisions. It's a great answer. A great way to close the podcast. Um, Ryan, thanks for coming on. I love the like the energy and the enthusiasm that you have. Obviously, like a great product mine, and you we're lucky to have you in crypto. Uh, Mert would say you got that riz, that that charisma. Um, Mert, to give you a shout out, I was listening to a to a podcast with Ryan that he did last month. And he actually gave you a shout out for being one of like the the best spokesperson on Twitter. So mm, one of the best, Ryan. one of the best, hands the down best. for sure. I wanted to make you blush, but um, <laughs> Ryan, thanks thanks so much for coming on. It's a lot of fun. I'd love to have you on in a couple months. So thanks again. This is fun. We'll do it, boys. It was great. All right. We'll see you next time.